Ruth, Garrick, DiMaggio, Mantle. At least one of the four greatest players of all time had been on the Yankees for over 40 consecutive years. In the 43 years from 1921 to 1964, the New York Yankees made the World Series 26 times. Over those 26 World Series, they won 18 of them. But in 1964, the Yankees would lose a seven-game World Series against the St. Louis Cardinals. And afterwards, for the first time in three generations, they were bad. Missing the Fall Classic in eight straight seasons, CBS, the Yankees owners, looked to sell the team. And for $10 million, they sold it to the head of a shipbuilding company named George Steinbrenner. George Steinbrenner didn't like floppy hair. When he arrived at his first spring training, he didn't even know his players' names, but he could see their numbers. He wrote down the numbers of the biggest aggressors and then instituted policy that remains with the Yankees to this day. No mullets, no beard. Played in pinstripes, you have to be clean shaven. The boss, as he was called, had arrived. And in his years as Yankee owner, anything seemed possible. At halftime at a basketball game in Reno, Nevada, Yankee manager Billy Martin gets a drink. Roy Hagar, a reporter for the Reno Evening Gazette, recognizes Martin and starts to interview him. Billy answers a few questions, but then complains that reporters always twist his words. He wants to see Hager's notes. No, says Hager. Martin insists and reaches for the notes. When Hager hides them behind his back, Martin feels justified to start swinging. The blows knocked off Hager's glasses, chipped at least three teeth, and left a gash above his eye. He was the quickest guy I had ever been in a fight with, said Hager. I couldn't even get a punch in. Billy Martin was a brilliant manager. He was passionate, cunning, and a great motivator. When the New York Yankees hired him in 1976, he led the team to the playoffs for the first time since 1964. In the fifth game of the ALCS, Chris Chambliss came to bat with the chance to win it with a home run. He hits one deep to right center! That ball is out of here! The Yankees win the pennant! Nowadays, players would celebrate on the field, but in 76, the players tried desperately to escape the field. It's been speculated whether or not Chambliss even ever touched home plate. Billy Martin had a dark side. Once, when he saw his team eating casually after a loss, he flipped over the table of food and decried the relaxed effort. His ego was fragile, and he would always butt heads with Steinbrenner and players. The biggest ego he had a problem with on the Yankees was their best hitter, Reggie Jackson. It's June 1977, and Reggie Jackson is hanging out by his locker at Yankee Stadium, talking to Sport Magazine reporter Robert Ward. Jackson was signed in the offseason by Steinbrenner to help the Yankees not only make the World Series, as they had in 1976, but win it, as Reggie had done three times as a member of the Oakland Athletics. You know, Jackson says to Ward, this team, it all flows from me. I've got to keep it all going. I'm the straw that stirs the drink. Yankees captain Thurman Munson was irate with this quote. The leader in the clubhouse, Munson, thought the quote reflected a poor attitude. All the Yankees contributed to their success, not just one. Billy Martin hated it too. One week later at Fenway Park, Reggie didn't run after a bloop single, letting the Red Sox get an extra base. In the middle of the inning, Martin sent in a replacement for right field, embarrassing Reggie in front of millions on television. Oh, look at, look at this. Reggie and Billy went after it in the dugout, with Billy ultimately having to be restrained from going after his own player. In that year's World Series, 1977, Reggie proved that he was a big-time star. An outstanding World Series, three home runs in one game. Despite all the dysfunction, the Yankees would win the 1977 World Series thanks to Jackson's heroics. The Yankees again rushed to the dugout, trying to avoid the thousands of fans who wanted to celebrate with them. Now that was a day I'll never forget, and it helped me to get my own candy hit. Reggie, with a rich caramel center, lots of fresh roasted peanuts, and a super chocolatey covering. Reggie, the candy they named after me. Mmm. Reggie, you taste pretty good. On opening day 1978, the Yankees gave out Reggie bars to every attendee. When Reggie hit a home run early in the game, fans utilized the chocolate bars in a different way than intended. Thousands threw their chocolate bars onto the field, causing a significant delay. Aside from the Reggie bar incident, 1978 did not start out well for the Yankees. They were losing games. When a reporter asked Billy Martin how he felt about Reggie and George, he said they're perfect for each other. One's a liar and the other's a convict. The liar being Reggie, and the convict meaning George. A reference to when George Steinbrenner made illegal contributions to Richard Nixon's re-election campaign. 
Steinbrenner had enough. This quote, along with the aforementioned fight in Reno, caused him to make a change. In June 1978, Billy Martin was fired for the first time. Five days after Martin was fired was Old Timer's Day. Steinbrenner had thought the Yankees needed to change and signed manager Bob Lemon to a contract through the 1979 season. However, in a totally unprecedented move, Steinbrenner had Yankees public address announcer Bob Shepard make an announcement at Old Timer's Day. That the manager of the Yankees for the 1980 season and hopefully for many years after that will be number one, Billy Martin. Fans went nuts. To review, Steinbrenner had just announced who his, who his manager would be, not right now, not next season, but the season after next season in 1980. The 78 Yankees ended up making one of the greatest comebacks in sports history, beating the Red Sox in a one-game playoff and repeating as world champions. Despite the chaos, Steinbrenner was able to stack his team with talented players thanks to the newly created free agency process. The ballpark experience was changing as well in 1978. That year, Philadelphia Philly fans were greeted by a furry green creature who became known as the Philly Fanatic. The Yankees wanted in on this mascot action and hired a firm to develop a name for their new character. They came up with the name Dandy, as in Yankee Doodle Dandy. Steinbrenner cautiously approved having the bat-shaped character modeled after his captain Thurman Munson roamed the ballpark. But later that year, the Yankees outfitter Lou Pinella got in a fight with the San Diego Chicken. Mascots don't belong in the field, said George. When Dandy made his debut, he was relegated to entertain fans only in the upper deck. Bob Lemon was fired early, and Steinbrenner's plan for Martin to return in 1980 was moved up to the summer of 1979. At a road trip in Minnesota that year, Martin beat up a marshmallow salesman named Joseph Cooper. After researching this incident extensively, it is clear the only reason that Martin beat him up was the fact that he was a marshmallow salesman. On August 1st, 1979, the New York Yankees were in the heat of the pennant race when they won 9-1 against the Chicago White Sox. Throughout all the chaos of the last three years, with an owner, manager, and star player all bickering in the press, Thurman Munson had kept everyone at ease. He was a veteran presence who had won three gold gloves behind the plate and the 1976 ALMEP. In order to tend to his family in Ohio, on off days, Munson had begun to learn how to fly. New York Yankees catcher Thurman Munson was killed today in the crash of a small airplane at the Akron Canton Airport in Ohio. Reports were two other people were in the small plane with him. The plane belonged to Munson. He had bought it recently and was learning to fly. The air controller said it had been making practice takeoffs and landings when it crashed about a thousand feet from the runway. Thurman Munson, dead at the age of 32. The following night, the Yankees held a moment of silence for their beloved captain. The 1979 team collapsed, unable to go on without their guiding catcher. Due to Dandy's resemblance to the now deceased Munson, the mascot was scrapped. With the Yankees' moral compass gone, George, Billy, and the Yankees would enter the most chaotic decade in the franchise's history, the 1980s. You know, a lot of people think Billy and I argue all the time. Actually, we agree on just about everything, right, Bill? Yeah, you betcha, George. We even drink the same beer. Light beer from Miller's. Light's got a third less calories than the regular beer, and it's less filling. And the best thing is, it tastes so great. No, George, the best thing is less filling. No, Bill, it tastes great. Less filling, George. Billy, it tastes great. Less filling, George. Billy? Yeah, George. You're fired. Oh, not again. <laughs> Light beer from Miller. After the Yankees lost the third game of the 1981 World Series, George Steinbrenner claims two Dodger fans recognized him in a Los Angeles hotel elevator. The boss claims that they made fun of him. Steinbrenner said in rapid succession he threw two punches at the fans, two rights and a left. Down went the first fan and down went the second. Quote, there are two guys in this town looking for their teeth and two guys who will probably sue me, he said that night at an impromptu press conference. It's speculated whether this incident ever happened. Some think that George made it up to try to motivate his team to turn the 81 series around. 
but it didn't work, and the Yankees would lose the 1981 World Series in six games. In 1983, Steinbrenner hired Billy Martin for the third time. We had a lot of long talks with George. A lot of guys were going to wonder how we're going to get along. Like I'm sure you're going to ask me that question later on. Well, we've straightened a lot of things out. They'll, uh, for instance, I'll be handling all the trades. What do you mean? Uh, there'll be no phone calls in the dugout. What do you mean? That is not. No. That's not right. I'm handling the trades. That isn't the way we say it. I have it, the right to call you in the dugout, well, and that's not the way it's going to be, George. Well, you're damn right it is, and if you don't like it, you're fired. You haven't hired me yet. But this time in 1983, Martin beat up a real estate agent at a bar. He was let go again after the season. That year, 1983, the Yankees had a new star debut, a young first baseman from Indiana named Don Mattingly. Like Munson and DiMaggio before him, Donnie Baseball did everything right, and he became the face of the franchise. All and uh, they knew it would not damage his psyche. He pitched a little bit. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Look at that little red-headed fellow. In Steinbrenner's desperate attempt to claim a title, he fired people all the time. In his first 23 seasons, he changed manager 20 times. In his first 26 years, he went through 13 publicity directors. Big free agent signings also came and went. All-time stolen base leader Ricky Henderson used to brag that from his Manhattan apartment, he could see the entire state building. Future Hall of Famer Dave Winfield was meant to replace Reggie Jackson, who went to the California Angels. When Winfield had a poor series late in the season, Steinbrenner complained to the press that instead of Mr. October, a nickname Jackson was given for his postseason heroics, Winfield looked more like Mr. May. It was the beginning of an epic feud. Don Mattingly continued to produce, winning nine gold gloves and the 1983 MVP. But on July 4, 1987, he aggravated his back and was diagnosed with a rare condition called spinal stenosis. His back was then in a permanent state of pain. For the second half of his career, he struggled to stay on the field. George Steinbrenner was annoyed with the team's performance in 1989 and privately told Billy Martin he'd be coming back for a sixth stint as Yankee manager in 1990. Celebrating his promotion with a friend on Christmas Day 1989, Martin went to a local bar near his home in Binghamton, New York. Five-time New York Yankees manager Billy Martin died last night at the age of 61. Police investigators struggled to figure out who was driving, but one thing was certain, both Martin and his friend were drunk. Dave Winfield felt like he was being followed, but he couldn't put his finger on why. He was suing George Steinbrenner for $500,000 that the Yankees never paid to his charity, even though it was stipulated in his contract. Winfield's instincts were right. He was being followed by a gambler named Howard Spira, who the ball who Steinbrenner had paid $40,000 to dig up dirt on his own star. When baseball commissioner Faye Vincent found out about this, he banned Steinbrenner from the Yankees for two seasons. With Steinbrenner out of the picture, the Yankees began a massive rebuild. Overhauling George's common practice of trading prospects for aging stars and starting to develop new talent, GM Gene Michael signed a player out of Panama named Mariano Rivera and drafted a young shortstop named Derek Jeter. Buck Showalter, an assistant under Billy Martin, took over the Yankee manager job in 1992 and did something no Yankee manager had been able to do in over 20 years. He kept the job for more than two seasons. In 1995, Don Mattingly said it was his final season. For the first time since 1981, the Yankees made the playoffs that year, and they played the first ever division series against the Seattle Mariners. In the sixth inning of Game 2, down by one, Don Mattingly, who'd spent 15 years waiting to play in the playoffs, came to the plate. This one by Mattingly. Oh, hang on to the roof. Goodbye, home run, Don Mattingly. In a five-game series, the Yankees won the first two games, but lost the next three in epic and fashion. Andrew Martinez swung on the line, down the left field line for a base hit. Here comes Joy. Here is Junior to third base. They're going to wave him in. The throw to the plate will be late. The Mariners are going to play for the American League Championship. I don't believe it. Steinbrenner's ban was over. He was just as ruthless as ever. He fired Showalter and hired veteran manager Joe Torre. The Yankees would win four out of the next five World Series, returning glory to the franchise. Dave Winfield was so upset with Steinbrenner that he went into the Hall of Fame a San Diego Padre, despite having more success with the Yankees. Reggie Jackson made the Hall of Fame in 1993. The Reggie Barr was discontinued in 1981. 
Billy Martin was one of the winningest managers in MLB history, but efforts to vote him into the Hall of Fame failed. Nobody remembers Dandy existed, and there have been no attempts by the Yankees to replace him with a different mascot. Lou Pinella, the Yankee outfielder who got into a fight with the San Diego Chicken, became a manager, and like his protege Mitt Billy Martin, always got his money's worth during an ejection. In 1998, the Arizona Diamondbacks hired Buck Showalter to be their first ever manager. Again, he built up a winning team and was fired before the 2001 season. That year, the Diamondbacks won the World Series against the Yankees, ending the Yankees' new dynasty. Twice, Showalter built up winning teams, and twice, he was let go the year before they won it all. As of 2022, he's managing the New York Mets, still trying to win a championship for the first time. Don Mattingly currently manages the Miami Marlins. In our federal investigation of the Munson crash, it was found that Thurman had overlooked many essential rules of flying, including going through a checklist of all equipment to make sure nothing was off. His family settled out of court with the company who gave him flying lessons. George Steinbrenner died in 2010. His son Hal owns the team today. For the Yankees fan base, Steinbrenner's tenacity is remembered more than his antics. The good times, better than the bad. The New York Yankees are the winningest team in sports history. Their generational success gives them the highest expectations any team could have. For the characters around the team, the prestige of the pinstripes is addictive. The media microscope drives egos mad. In the Bronx, if you win, it is glorious. Lose, and it's chaos. The only certainty is it's always interesting.